serve such a wonderful God. Jesus is all the world to me. He is all the world to me. I have a question. Has anybody, maybe as of late or at certain times in your life, just turned into a big fat baby? I have a couple of giggles, so y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm sorry, I didn't mean fat like fat. I mean, just, anybody ever get real weepy? I was talking to Brother Isaiah about this. I've get, been getting real weepy. And uh, while I was gone, uh, conference, just, just start thinking about the Lord or start thinking about really a home praying for y'all. Just get weepy. You know, and I was telling them I was on the way, we were on the way back into Fairbanks from Anchorage, and last last leg, we got like 20 minutes left or 15 minutes left or something, and, and I was thinking, oh, we we're almost home. Jackson was sitting behind me, and he was shaking my seat like, what in the world, dude? And he goes, Dad, we're almost home. I was like, yeah, we're, we're almost home. While I was gone, I asked the Lord, I said, God, what in the world is my problem? Because my, my grandfather was weepy. He's the only person I, I, that I've, I've known to, to, on the happiest day of the year, on your birthday when you're getting presents, he's sitting in his chair crying. And it's like, Grandpa, what's wrong? And he's like, I hope I can become half the man y'all think I am. It's like, bro, ah. Oh. While we were gone, I was praying to the Lord, and I said, God, what is my problem? We're, we're like at the, uh, it's not the happiest place on earth. That's not what Disney is. At the most magical place, I think, is what they call it now. We were, you know, we were down there for a couple days of Disney hurricane and things. I never got my T-shirt. Somebody said they would make me a T-shirt. Well, maybe they didn't say they would make it. They said it could be made. I survived Hurricane Ian. That's what I want. But just, just even sitting there in the in the B and B, just, just cry, the drop of a hat. And as Brother Rhymes would say, sometimes I throw the hat down. I said, God, what is going on? And he said, He said, think about the times you've been weepy. He said, every time you get this way, it's when I'm taking you into a new dimension. Let me get weepy again. He said, when you get weepy, it's because you're drawing so close to me. Because when, when I'm pushing you into the next dimension, he said, you never go alone. He said, and, and because I am love and you feel nothing but love, nothing but love, I draw you close to me where the enemy cannot tell where I stop and you begin. That's where you get weepy because I take you into new dimensions. And I said, God, is, is that what I'm feeling? He said, when you get this way, it's always because you are so close to me so we can move you into a new dimension. <laughs> Telling Brother Isaiah, I was like, we get to that place and it's like, I love you. Enemies, I leave and love you. just love everything when you're that close to God and I just I don't know where we're going but I've been weepy for weeks such a beautiful presence of God is in this place Even the sickness that I'm dealing with right now, I, my body's going to be miserable. I don't want to be outside of the presence of God. I want to be so connected with Him. I would say this, that if you're not in a weepy stage right now, 
that after service, I'd like you to go home and I'd like you to take stock of your life. I mean, be honest with yourself. It's just you and God. Don't lie. You know better. God knows better. Take stock of yourself. Take stock of your life and see what it is that's distracting you from being that close to God. See what it is that has come between you and God. God just, He whispers. He whispers and I, and I hear it. It's almost as though He thinks and I sense it when we're in these times. We started the first song and I stood and raised my hands and as I opened up my eyes, I looked around and I saw the worship going forth and, and God whispered to me, He said, what's it for? What's it for? You come into the presence of the Almighty and, and it doesn't spur us to reach out and to love on the lost then what is all this for? I'm telling you, God wants to move us into a new dimension and that new dimension is walking in Him. If you don't love the things He loves, you don't know Him. If you aren't burdened with the things He's burdened with, you don't know Him. My Bible tells me in Daniel, the people that do know their God shall be strong and do. Exploits does not show up in the original. Do. You will do. You will work. I'm so burdened to do the work of God. And I'm weepy because God's taken me into new places. Places I've never known. A local politician put on their Facebook page, make church music great again. I wanted to comment so bad, but I didn't. I think we should make church music worship again. I don't mean thankfulness. I don't mean praise. I mean getting into the worship. Coming back. God, I'm coming back to a heart of worship because it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Well, I don't do that. It's not about you. It's about him. That's not my personality. It's not about your personality. It's about him. I'm shy. It's not about your, 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 own, your own insecurities. It's about him. want to go on with Jesus whatever he chooses whatever he decides I just want to go on with him I just want to go on with him my wife almost made me a deal that I was allowed to come to church if I didn't hug anybody I'm not feeling well. And so the people that have hugged me, I've turned and they've hugged me. I didn't hug them. You blame me? They can't blame me. I told them all, don't hug me. Because I can't hug you. If y'all get sick, my wife will not let me come back. So <laughs> y'all just chill. <laughs> went to bed last night probably got to sleep about quarter after nine or so woke up this morning not bright eyed or bushy tailed <laughs> but I woke up this morning and went oh I gotta get up I can't, I can't lay here anymore I feel like I've been here all night what in the world it's like well my, my throat is feeling a little better than it normally does after a full night's rest bumped the table and looked at my watch and I was like, oh, 
three hours. It's midnight. So I got up, got up and went into the bathroom and tried to take care of all the headache and the pressure. And then I had to sit up for the next three hours, dozing in the chair as I could because I couldn't lay down. I've done nothing but sit around for like three days, four days. I'm miserable. I'm miserable. But I had to be here in the house of God. I begged, all that was to say that I begged God to let me preach today. I said, God, please, I don't care if you, if you send it back Sunday night after church. I'll, I'll be sick. Just let me preach. And God never took any of this stuff away. So um, I said, well, what do you want to happen? And he gave me three names. Uh, Brother and Sister Schroeder were two of them, and Jordy was the third. And so I have asked them to come. And um, Brother and Sister Schroeder, though they're not new to this area at all, not new to very many of us. I don't know that I know your testimonies. And so I'm very interested in your testimonies. I know Jorney a little better. Everybody knows Jorney better. She gets everywhere. I was looking at pictures today from, oh, this is us five years ago. I was like, man, it's just, it's got Jorney in there. She was around five years ago. But ask, uh, like there's some, there's some holes in her in her testimony that I don't know. So, um, but I'm gonna have um, I'm gonna have Sister Jorney come in and start it off, and then when she's done, um, Sister Schroeder, if you would, and I'm gonna have Brother Schroeder finish up. But if y'all would come on, God is using God is using who we are. And, our testimonies to get us to the next place and to help get others to the next place. It is so good to have my sister, my stepsister-in-law, Nene. It's good to have Nene with us today. Um, please stay in prayer for those that are sick. We have uh, Sister Tony is out with Melody. Um, sickness in their home, sickness brother Tommy and Lincoln uh, are sick, um, and then those that went to uh, to Anchorage for the quiz extravaganza rally weekend thing. We had 23 or 24 going, and I think we ended up with seven down there. So many, so many not able to go because of sickness. Sickness is kind of trying to run rampant. So please don't hug me. I want to be able to come back to church. Sister Jordan. Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord. I know I have my iPad, but I'm not going to preach, I promise. <laughs> um, I didn't ask if this was okay, so I guess this is me asking. <laughs> um. <laughs> Is it okay if I share a scripture? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to share something uh, with y'all. Um, um, from last Sunday, after last Sunday, uh, and I think many or most of you all were here, when we talked about beyond the veil, um, that, that, that deep place in God, we talk about going deeper in God and the deep things of God, and God, I wanna go deeper. And we talked about that place being the place beyond the veil. Um, and actually, Sister Schroeder shared this with me, and I, and I just wanted to share with everybody because it blew my mind. <laughs> um, but she uh, directed me to Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, verses 19 and 20, and I'll read it really quick, but Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into, his, into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. 
It blew my mind. <laughs> the veil <laughs> was his flesh. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember, remember learning in Sunday school about when Jesus died on the cross and the veil was torn? When his flesh died, that veil also, in a sense, died. His flesh was the veil. But this is what was that even further. She went take, took, took it a step further and said, she said, the Lord revealed this to me some time ago and showed this to me some time ago. That in order to enter to the holiest, the holy of holies, you have to go through that veil. It's in the same way that if we want to get to our salvation, Jesus first had to die. And she said, now when you look at our in a, a New Testament living, in a sense, um, and when we talk about going deeper in God, his flesh was already torn. But there's one more veil that needs to be torn. That's our own flesh. She said every time the veil correlates with flesh, Jesus' flesh and then our own, and our flesh is torn through the fasting, through the consecration, through the prayers, through the word. That's how we go to that, that next place. Um, and I just wanted to share that because I, that was just very fascinating to me, that any time in order to have access to the holiest, to the holy of holies, there had to be that veil that needed, we needed to get past. Um, and, and really, this does tie into my testimony. I, when pastor asked us to do this, I racked my brain, and I honestly don't even know that I've still decided which part of my testimony to even share. <laughs> There's so much I could share. Um, but I... Re I maybe will condense it to this, if I can. <laughs> um, many of you know I, I was not raised in apostolic church, apostolic truth, or anything of the sort. <laughs> um, I, uh, my family was born was born? Yeah, sure. Okay. They were. Um, my family is from Africa. Um, my parents were born in the Congo, and so was I. And then, um, fun fact about me, I was born during a war um, in my country. And so I actually was raised most of my life in a country called Gabon. Um, I counted a blessing, <laughs> um, by the way. I, I counted a, a, a big blessing. Some time ago, a few weeks ago, we had an opportunity to share uh, testimonies with one another. I believe it was on a Thursday night. Um, and I, I remember sharing that I, if I could, I don't know what to share with you right now, except um, I'm amazed at God because the life that I'm living today is not at all a life I could have ever even dreamed of or even imagined up. I, it's more than anything I could have even asked for. Um, looking at where I came from and where I am today. I'm just so grateful to God. Um, but uh, growing up, I, 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 we, my family went to church, I do recall. I slept the whole time, but I was there. <laughs> um, and uh, I've said this before uh, to me. I, I think it was just the Lord protecting me. He's like, you don't need to hear all this. <laughs> Not because... <laughs> This is not an excuse for people to fall asleep in church, but I say that the Lord was protecting me because the Lord was, I really, I sincerely believe this, that the Lord was just protecting my mind from hearing what was not truth. The Lord was just protecting my heart and my mind from hearing what, what was not actually going to lead me to him. No shade to anybody. <laughs> um, but I, I ran up. My family did go to church, but I was never engaged. Um, and it, it wasn't until I was 11 years old, turning 12, we moved to Maine. How did I go from Africa to Maine? There's a lot in between. I'm trying to, I'm trying to move fast. <laughs> um, um, and I remember that 
when we moved to Maine, we were looking for a church, and then eventually we, we found a church because somebody was like, hey, I go to this church, and I know you don't have a car yet, um, but, you know, they have a van. We, they can pick you up. And so we started going to this church um, that started preaching about this one God and Holy Ghost and always talking about how you had to read the Bible. What? <laughs> um, it was all very new to me. I remember it, it was all very new to me, um, but it, it got my attention. It had my attention. Um, and, and something that I would, at the time, I was only still just in Sunday school. And I remember in Sunday school, we would have a memory verse. Um, and every week, even though I had never read through the Bible, I didn't really understand everything, I knew that there was an expectation of me, and that was to learn my memory verse. So I did. <laughs> I learned my memory verse um, every single week. I uh, got to the point to where, like, the teachers would have to give me even more. They're like, well, since you already learned this, I'm going to give you a whole chapter to learn. And they would give me more content to learn. This is going somewhere, I promise. Um, and, and I did. Then some months later, I got invited to go to camp with them. I had never been, and I went to camp. And my very first day, the very first day of camp, and I think I've shared this before, but the very first day of camp, um, I got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> actually, camp hadn't started. It was actually orientation. Um, <laughs> I got the Holy Ghost at orientation. Um, <laughs> um, and it's just, oh, yeah, I, it's funny every time I, I say that. But um, I got the Holy Ghost. And, and really, from that point forward, everything in my life changed. Um, from that very moment when I received the Holy Ghost, I, I remember that was the very first time in my life that I felt I clearly heard the voice of God. Um, because as soon as I got the Holy Ghost, and when I was, in a sense, coming to, there's so much more details to it, but when I was afterwards coming to, um, it was like God was just whispering in my spirit. And he whispered some things to me that... I, I, I never fought any, any, I didn't fight any of it. And there were just some things that he said, okay, this part of your life needs to change. This in your life needs to change. This, this, this. But he didn't lay it out to me as like, okay, do, these are your do's and don'ts from now on. But it was such a sweet, gentle spirit, um, a, a sweet, gentle voice of how he wanted me to live my life moving forward. Not, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> Very easy. Easy, yes. Um, I, I share all of that um, to lead to this point. Um, I, I, I've said it before, I believe, from, from this pulpit too, that I received the Holy Ghost when I was 12, and I was going to church faithfully from then. Uh, the church that I grew up in had a morning and a night service. I, I would go to church faithfully. I never missed a service, and I made a, a vow with God, a covenant with God, that, Lord, I will live for you the rest of my life. I'll give you everything if you will just be with me. If you will just keep me, if you will just not let go of me, I will do anything and everything that you want. I was just ready to serve God. <laughs> I'm like, he showed himself to me. How could I not? <laughs> oh, um, and I made that commitment to the Lord um, but the honest truth is, I, I wholeheartedly believed in God, and I wholeheartedly believed that, that there was one God, but I did not have the understanding of the one God. And it wasn't until three years later, y'all, I went to church faithfully. I did all the things. But it wasn't until three years later, as a Bible quizzer, we went to Oklahoma for nationals. And before leaving on, on one of those days before we, I don't think we had, I think it was the first day of NYC, because um, usually it goes nationals, leads right into the NYC. And so quizzing was over. It was going to be the first day of um, services for NYC. I was getting ready that morning. And as I was getting ready, just, it looked like a piece of paper in front of me. It's like there was a piece of paper in front of me, and I didn't have anything in front of me, but there was a piece of paper in front of me, it looked like. And there was writing, 
And it was like at the very top, it was basically my Bible. And it was John 1.1. 1, 1, and at the very top was highlighted, the first verse was highlighted, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then it, like, it was like scroll down to the bottom and highlighted verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It was then that I understood the oneness of God. It was then that I got it, and I, I, I had the full revelation of the oneness of God. All of that <laughs> to share two things, I think. <laughs> One, we talk about the importance of the word um, a lot. And that is something that I have seen the Lord use in my life personally and is a part of my testimony. Because the thing is, John chapter 1 is one of those scriptures that after I learned my memory verse, my Sunday school teacher said, well, since you learned your memory verse here, I want you to go learn this chapter. And even when I memorized it at the time, I didn't fully grasp and understand what it was that I was putting into my mind and into my spirit. But God was using it all that time and using it all that time. And it was still in there. I had downloaded it into me and it was stored in there so that one day he could show it to me and reveal it to me. So that one day he could give me the understanding of who he was. But it required me being faithful. See, okay, here's what I'm, <laughs> I don't know if, I'm not saying this is the right way to do things, but I learned to trust God and do what he wanted of me, even though I didn't fully understand. It's not to give myself kudos or anything, but I look back and I'm like, I, I could and I should have given up because I didn't get it. But the Lord will honor our faithfulness. And sometimes God is just wanting us to do the thing. And then he will give you the understanding. But he wants to see our faithfulness first. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. I, oh, God is good. <laughs> Oh, and then the next thing, so the word is a part of my testimony, um, but the other thing, past, uh, Pastor, well, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you shared that, um, what, there's something you shared just now, that I'm, I'm really grateful that you shared it, because I've always been scared, kind of nervous to, to even share this part of my own story, um, and this wasn't the beginning part of how I initially came to know God. Well, actually it is. <laughs> one of those scriptures, going back to the word, that was always in my heart. And this one stuck with me. This was one of those verses, again, I learned in Sunday school, I memorized it. And this one stuck with me. At the time, again, I really didn't know why, but this one stuck with me. And it was Romans 12, 1 and 2. I'm going to misquote it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that. Amen. Y'all know it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that scripture... Um, has always been a part of my walk and my relationship with God. And the Lord helped me to understand that, Jorney, if you will always be faithful in giving yourself as a sacrifice unto me, if you will be faithful and not conform to this world, if you will be faithful and allow me to conform you, <laughs> then you will go to those places. <laughs> and it goes back. It goes back to that veil. That living for God is about being that living sacrifice. If we will have that mindset and that concept of God, I will be your sacrifice. I will be your sacrifice, Lord. <laughs> it will allow us and give us access to those deep places and to that holy of holies. But the other part of my testimony, I'm almost done. <laughs> oh, I don't know why I'm sharing this. Ah. 
Um, here we go. There's that weeping. <laughs> I love the Lord so much, <laughs> and I am one of those people that I, I love everybody, even my enemies. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I am one of those people, those like happy-go-lucky people. Um, um, oh, man, okay, but. Recently, I can put it that way. <laughs> Recently, I had to go through um, probably one of the darkest seasons of my life. Uh, um, so dark that I got to a point where I, I really felt like I was just bones on a pew. A very dark season of my life where I constantly and I, and I never really questioned God but I would go to God and say God why I don't understand God why and but the beautiful thing about it is even though it was one of the darkest seasons of my life it was also at the same time one of the most beautiful seasons of my life in that time, and, and I promise I, I'm not sharing this to boast or anything, um, in that time, the Lord had put on me um, and requested of me because I, I, I wanted something. And I said, Lord, I, I, he gave me a vision for something. And I said, Lord, if that's really who you want me to be, if you really want me to go to those places, I know I can't make it there on my own, so I need you. And so the Lord called me to some deep consecration, <laughs> um, deep consecration, and which required a lot of fasting. I'm not going to tell you how much. That's okay. It was a dark time. It was a dark season. But through that time, because I said, okay, Lord, I really, really want you, and I know that I need you in my life, I am going to commit to consecrating myself so that I can be who you want me to be and who you've called me to be. I, the Lord took me to some places that I, I still haven't even shared with people and allowed me to have encounters with him that I still haven't even had the courage to share because I'm like, well, maybe, maybe I'm just a little bit like loose. <laughs> and one of those things was, I remember one day specifically, I uh, I got up to have my time with the Lord in the morning. And the presence of God that saturated that room. I can't even explain it. I, I can't even explain. <laughs> and I remember that whole day that entire day, and I really mean the entire day, I would just have random moments in the day where I would just feel the Lord just sweeping and walking. And I could feel his presence so strong and so much, I would just begin to weep. I would just begin to weep because he was that close. <laughs> he was that close that I would just weep. I would be driving. <laughs> I am not kidding y'all. I mean, I, was, I couldn't even go to work that day because of how strong it was. I, I, I couldn't go to work that day. I'm not saying don't go to work. <laughs> but I remember I would even be driving and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there he would be again. And I would just weep. And I would say, Lord, I got to drive. I got to see. <laughs> you can't do this to me. <laughs> I don't entirely know why the Lord is having me share this. And I need to get, I need to let, put this microphone down, Lord. <laughs> Apostolics of Fairbanks. 
if it's okay to say this, Pastor, God is, (laughs) that message that I preached on Sunday came from a place not just of this is what you preach on Sunday, but it came from a place of personal experience. That if we want to go deeper, Sometimes going deeper and going into the holy of holies is going to seem like you're just going into a cloud of darkness because you're leaving that candle behind in the other room. If y'all remember in the holy place, there was the candle, there was the bread. (laughs) And sometimes when you're going to that holy of holies and you're going into that deeper place it might even feel like Lord are you even my provider right now (laughs) because I don't see the provision (laughs) sometimes when you when God is taking you a little bit deeper it's gonna feel like he's crushing you because he is (laughs) But he's not crushing you to destroy you. He also tired. It's gonna feel a little weighted, a little heavy. But God is saying, if you will just trust me through this, I'm gonna take you somewhere that not everybody gets to go. Amen. Amen. You know, it's sometimes, sometimes you think it's just a simple testimony. I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes about what God's done for me. And, you know, I think that, that being instant in season, out of season is not something that we really strive for. I think it's something that we try to strive for, but I think it's just something that happens. And when you get into that vein 
It doesn't matter where you start. Brother Kilgore used to say, he said, I'll, have, I'll, I'll study and I'll study and I'll study. And he said, and I'll preach my notes until I fill the vein. When I get into the vein of what God's trying to do, I'll just close my notes and then I'll minister. You know, a testimony, it, it doesn't, you know, <laughs> we overcame him by the word, by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. That's what it says in Revelations. That, that word of our testimony, that testimony is something that nobody can argue with you about. That's your story. That's your story. And today, so far, has just shown us what a testimony can lead us into. A testimony rather than just a history lesson of somebody can actually change the direction of a church. Amen? That flesh, uh, Sister Joni was talking about beyond the veil, and Sister Schroeder shared that. You know, it, it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden when, when man and, and woman was kicked out of the Garden of Eden. From that time forward, flesh was never meant to live forever. And I will, I will do this. I will get into this. But there are two ways to, to destroy flesh. For us, our responsibility or it'll happen because it's the way God set it forth. Your flesh will either be destroyed because of leprosy, the rotting of the flesh, because it's not supposed to be connected with us, or it'll be through spiritual circumcision where we cut off that flesh. But we're, we're getting rid of it somehow because it's not, it's not God's will that any should perish. What is flesh? It's something that eventually will die and will perish. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that opens up the process of circumcision rather than allowing our flesh to rot. See, the whole Bible, I love the Word of God. You never know what things are connected. And then, poof, it's all connected. It's all connected. Sister Schroeder, if you come. Hello? Oh, much better. <laughs> um, I... It was sprung on me about 30 seconds after service started that I was speaking today. So um, uh, I'm a teacher. I'm used to preparing and then speaking. So this was new for me. But uh, through the song service, I comfort myself with scripture. I will be anxious for nothing. I will make my request made known to you. I need you to let me know what you want me to share. What these precious people who are here today most need to hear today. Um, and the Lord started giving me a few ideas, or they came to my head. If it was me or him, I don't know. And then what Brother Tim said was reinforcing it. And then what Pastor said was reinforcing it. And then what Jorney said was reinforcing it. And I'm like, oh, I just love you, my orchestrator. <laughs> you just put everything together so beautifully. Um, some of you have probably heard the name Schroeder. Um, I was baptized in um, the sanctuary church in, actually this month, it's 33 years ago, 1989. My father and I are both, we're both first generation Pentecostals. We were baptized the same day. Um, Verley Johnson, you may know Brother Verley Johnson is my dad. So um, I came to this truth because of precious, quiet little Kathy. Don't let her fool you. That woman's a powerhouse of prayer. Uh, she won my dad, and she won me, and she won my husband, and it's taken over multiple wings of the family by now. But um, as Sister Jorney was speaking and sharing with you today about how the word of God was something God used to keep her and to draw her and to um, develop her Christian life, I want to speak to you just a little bit about the power of prayer. I would like to give you some examples of what God has done through prayer in my life. Um, 
first of all, what I guess is the where I come from, my mother was a witch, a professing, practicing witch. And growing up, I, you know, whatever happens in your house you think is normal. And um, God knew I was going to be a preacher one day, so I can only let you imagine what my childhood was like with spiritual warfare. Um, it was horrific. And I came um, from a place of intense, tormenting fear that I just thought everybody felt like that. I couldn't shampoo my hair without burning my eyes because the moment I closed my eyes, I knew there was something behind me. And I thought everybody felt that way. So I would shampoo my hair with my eyes open. I called these things, um, um, what is the name? Irrational fears, fears of stupid things. And I just thought, well, this is what life is like as a human. Um, and then when I moved to Alaska for college, I came up here to live with my dad to go to UAF in 1988. And he was dating this little Pentecostal woman. And she started teaching me a Bible study. And um, I'm a very information-oriented person because God created me to be a teacher. So with that gifting, calling, what person, whatever you want to call it, comes a whole slew of personality traits. One of them is I operate on information. But God did bless me to come from a place of no doctrine whatsoever because it is really easy to import false ideas and not even knowing you're doing it. So when I came in and I was, I was science-centered, I wanted information. That's why I studied creation. That's why I get into the scripture. That's why I'm not afraid of science. Science is not the opposite of Christianity. Science is the study of everything God made. It will never contradict his Bible. If it's done right, it will always glorify God. But when I came and got saved... Now I didn't just have irrational things to be afraid of. Does that make sense? Now there's a devil. Okay? A real tormenting devil. And my irrational fears all of a sudden became overwhelming, crippling, debilitating, tormenting fear. And it's tied to my mother's witchcraft. And it took me decades to realize that's where it came from. But I, it was so bad. I, I've shared the testimony, and I won't even give details, because I'm not even going to give the devil that foothold in your life to plant the kind of fears he put in me. So I'm just going to tell you, it got to the place where I couldn't sleep. Every time I would even begin to fall asleep, um, it would freeze me and torment me, and I would hear the things it was going to do to my children, and I would hear, and I couldn't, I would go days without sleep, and it finally got to where I cried out, God, why are you letting this happen? You can stop this instantly. Why? Why do you let this keep happening? They're going to have to lock me up because my mind will snap. I cannot survive this. It has to stop. And I was laying there alone because my husband worked nights. <laughs> and I was alone with two toddlers, just little babies, and I couldn't sleep. And I cried out to God, I am at a breaking point, and I was not lying. And I felt like a rubber stamp in my mind. Trust me. Trust me. And so... I tried to go to sleep, and I'd close my eyes, and I'd open them, and I'd close my eyes, and I'd open them, and I'd close my eyes, and until I could finally fall asleep, and uh, I didn't know how to break free of this. I was a studier. I read my Bible through at least once every year. Multiple times was not unusual. I studied. I studied. I studied faith, which has to be the opposite of fear, right? I studied. I studied every verse on faith. I filled up notebooks. <laughs> come to find out, faith is not the opposite of fear. For the scripture says, what casts out all fear? Love. Love is the antidote to fear. But it wasn't just me being afraid. Please understand. 
I was under massive demonic attack, okay? And I'm like, okay, so I had the realization that it wasn't faith I needed to study, it was love. And how, how do you study love? And it comes down to relationship. It's relationship. I don't care what your ministry is. I don't care what position you hold. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? We get too hung up on the vessel. Oh, well, he is so sanctified. He has such a position that God has anointed the position. She is so sweet and selfless and giving. No wonder God can use her. Forget the vessel. We're all flesh, and there is no good thing in flesh, okay? It is a willingness to give yourself to God. Are you willing to let go of what you want? Are we willing to be a vessel he can flow through? Because it's not about how perfect the vessel is. Remember the one time he didn't have any flawed human vessel, so he used a donkey? Do you remember this? Okay, how sanctified and dedicated and pure do you think that donkey was? Okay, God will use whatever vessel decides to make itself available, to dump, but we have to dump the junk that's in there, okay? And re it's about relationship. So God clearly, and I wasn't one who, oh, God told me this, God he, give, he would give me feelings and leadings and directions. He wasn't speaking to me in words. And he deals with everyone differently. But I knew God had called me into a season of extended fasting. Again, I'm seeing a theme here. A season. And I wanted to do it right. And the Bible says you do not fast to be seen of men or guess what? That's the only reward you're going to get is they saw you. So I'm like, I'm not... John, this is what I'm feeling God's calling me to do. And I told him, and he said, no. And I, I said, okay. And I waited. And the next service, it must have been spoken. The exact numbers I gave him were spoken over the pulpit 15 times. And we left church. I didn't say a word. We got in the car. He starts the car. He looks at me. Okay, you can fast. <laughs> I can take a hint, he said. So I went into my season. I went into this season begging God to take this huge Sherman tank worth of weight off of my shoulders, which was, in my mind, tormenting fear. This insurmountable, mountainous problem, so big, I couldn't even, you know, in my mind, I was fasting to get away from this. Through that six months, everything changed. Everything changed. Um, without me realizing it, the fear fell away. Can I even say that? This thing that was all I had ever prayed about was all I could try to get through was what I was physically fighting to exhaustion every day of my life. It fell away and I didn't notice it because my spirit was changing. My relationship was growing because when you get past the flesh, the spirit flies Please understand, this is truth. This isn't cliche. This is truth. I would wake up in the morning, and you know when you're just dredging, your, your consciousness is coming to the surface, and you're not even there yet. I, literally, I would be waking up, and before my mind hit consciousness, I could feel like my spirit would sit up and go, I love you, Jesus. And that was how I woke up. And I would walk for hours, and I would pray, and I would talk to God, and, and I'd just tell him everything. One day I got into this place where I'm like, okay, well, confess your faults. I haven't done that in a long time, so let's do that. I walked, and I started confessing my faults to God, areas where I needed work, things I knew were problems, issues, attitudes. Two miles later, I was still confessing faults. Two miles, okay? And it dawned on me, and I said, Lord, I am nothing but faults held together by the Holy Ghost. And he gave me the biggest witness in the spirit on that. 
but now I want to share something with you that I realized, okay? We are false. We are false. When we try to pray for somebody, if somebody is having an issue and we really care about them and we want to see this issue fixed, we'll put our hands on them and we'll pray. And we'll try to pray so hard and we'll try to put so much effort and emotion and energy into it. We cannot save. We cannot heal. Can you heal? I can't heal. Can you save? Me neither. Can you bring deliverance to somebody? Neither can I. <laughs> our power as Christians is in our relationship with the one who can do all of these things. Okay? <laughs> I was confessing faults, confessing faults, confessing faults. Oh, wait a minute, here's two more. You know, my, my, my fault pile was now bigger than me. I don't even know how that's possible. And I don't know if it was me because I see the world through scripture, period, or if it was God bringing it to me. But the verse, in your weakness, I am strong. In your weakness, he can be strong because we're weak. Guess what? I have all the qualifications to be used of God. Look at my pile of weaknesses. <laughs> seriously, this dawned on me and I started smiling. I'm like, Lord, I mean, seriously, look at these weaknesses. With as much weakness as I can offer you, you can be almighty in me. Do you understand? It's about relationship. And I don't care how much you or I or anybody else calls themselves Christian. If you do not pray, you're not even alive in God. He, he, without prayer, there is no relationship. And you don't have to do what I tried in the beginning, which is, okay, my time of prayer, I will set aside from six to seven, I will get on my knees, I will try to pray. No. <laughs> prayer is talking to God in the shower. Prayer is talking to God while you're driving to the grocery store. Prayer is talking to God as you're walking through the produce aisle. Prayer is constant, constant talking to our God. <laughs> Kiana used to elbow me in the produce section. Mom, what? You're talking in tongues again. I wouldn't mind, but that guy's looking at you. I'm like, was I out loud? <laughs> and, and this happens to me, okay? First of all, I am an auditory person. I am frighteningly, viciously non-visual. There's something wrong. I can't even call up an image. I've been married 32 years. Unless my husband is standing in front of me, I don't know what he looks like. I can't pull up an image. Honestly, there's, there's a... There's a, it's a fault somewhere. I'm not visual. And because of it, I'm very, very auditory. And auditory people, we do not care for it to be called talking to ourselves. Thank you very much. <laughs> we prefer the term thinking out loud. <laughs> this is what I do. <laughs> but now, now the, and I wanted to give you so many awesome testimonies of answered prayer in my life. Um, but I think the takeaway here is it's about relationship. Okay? If you are married and you never talk to that man or that woman, you have a piece of paper. You don't have a relationship. There's scripture, very frightening scripture, if you are carefully reading that says, and there are going to be those who come before the Lord and say, Lord, we've cast out devils in your name. We, in your name, we've healed and we've done miracles and wonders. Why won't you let us in? And he's going to say, because depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Okay? Now, please, please get the deep and scary part here. These people were operating in gifts. 
They were healing. They were casting out devils. They were doing miracles. You cannot do that without the Holy Ghost. And these people, he said, I never knew you. So the word of God, essential. Prayer is life. And you can do it a little bit at a time. Somebody once asked Smith Wigglesworth, you're so used of God, all these miracles. You must pray hours a day. How much time do you pray in a sitting? Like two hours at a time? He said, oh, no. He said, I rarely pray more than half an hour. And they're like, and he says, but a half an hour never goes by that I don't pray. You know, you can talk to God wherever you are. Seriously, do this. You're in the shower anyway. I thank you, Lord, that I am blessed to have a home with warm water whenever I want it. Do you know the fact that if you have any money in your pocket, if you have two nickels and a dime in your pocket, you are in the top 20% of the richest people in the world. World. And if you have any amount of money in a bank account, any, you're in the top 7% of the richest people in the world. We are born into a privileged and blessed country. And because it's all we've known, we take it for granted, just not, not out of ugliness, but because we don't realize it. We are so, so blessed. And it is so easy to just expect blessings that we've already had. But we need to have relationship. We need to have relationship with our God. Amen. That is beautiful. No, sorry. That is beautiful. So you can't, you can't bring up a, 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 a visible thing of, of anything like with your memory. You, you can't bring up like... <laughs> well, the, 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 the only reason I was asking is because you, you said there's a problem. And when we make it to heaven, all of our problems are going to be gone. So the first thing that you'll ever be able to recall is the face of Jesus. That's amazing. That's amazing. That is amazing. That, that blows my mind. I'm... I'm glad I don't have that, but I'm a little jealous. <laughs> Brother Schroeder, if you could. That's a tough act to follow. That's a couple tough acts to follow. God is so good. My name is John Schroeder. And... Uh, um, I grew up in this neighborhood, which is really awesome. I grew up out right off of Dale Road. Um, uh, first thing that happened to me um, with God that I can remember was uh, very young. I, too, went to another church, and I, too, was very famous for sleeping under the chairs. But in Sunday school classes, I was eight. They were teaching us Sunday school songs. And if anybody says that station wagons aren't cool, you are wrong. Station wagons are cool. Because me and my sister were riding in the back of a station wagon. I was eight. She was four. We were singing Sunday school songs. And my mom says, as she's driving down the road, she said, the car suddenly got thick with the presence of God. 
as we're singing. And she heard her two children in the back seat worshiping God in tongues. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I had no idea what had happened. But I picked up a, my Bible, and I started walking around the neighborhood, going to our neighbors and telling them about Jesus. This neighborhood. I was excited. I didn't know what happened to me, but something awesome just happened to me, and you got to hear about this. God is so good. God is sovereign. One of my favorite descriptions of God, he has your life planned out for you. If you'll just hook up and say, yes, Lord, it's an adventure. Little did I know that how many years later I would meet a young lady that was going through a Bible study and she was nervous to tell me. She goes, John, I'm going through a Bible study, and they talk in tongues. And she was bracing herself. And I said, I've done that. <laughs> I was like, what? Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. The Lord actually put um, a verse on my heart. And... Uh, it's on the same page that Journey pulled hers from, so it's pretty good. But Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, r while I was reading this, what came through my mind was, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So in this one verse, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. First of all, when you say now faith, well, you know, you're believing on something. Somebody walks up to you, well, when's that going to happen? When you say now, it just got real. Now faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Wait, the substance? Isn't, what is faith? Isn't faith like a thought? Isn't faith something that goes through your mind? But it's saying it's a substance. Substances are physical. Hmm, this is interesting. And I just pictured a man holding on to a cord. Um, see, I'm the opposite. I picture everything. I can't read a book without picturing everything. It's physically exhausting to read a book because I've got to do it panoramic, 3D, <laughs> technicolor. It's physically exhausting to read a book for me. <sighs> but I pictured a man holding a cord. And he's pulling with all of his might. And these three words were jumping out at me. First of all, this scripture is trying to pull something from the, the dimension that God is in into our dimension. So when it says substance, this is your hint. Substances are physical. So all of a, all of a sudden, we started in the spiritual and there's a change coming. There's a turn coming. There's, there's something happening here. And then he says, faith is the substance of things. Oh, what? Things are physical. But we're, a faith is a thought. It's the things hoped for, 
the evidence. Oh, wait a second. Now, when you say evidence, have you ever heard of anybody walking into a courtroom and they have a witness stand up and the witness say, well, I thought I saw something. <laughs> There's a reason they call it physical evidence. Hearsay isn't physical. Hearsay is not admissible in a court of law. Why? It's not physical. So this is the evidence. Wait a second here. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. God is trying in one short scripture to get you to think the exact opposite. Faith can be pulled into the physical. God is trying to pull things from his realm into our realm. And we do that by speaking. Speaking. But what do we speak? There's another, there's another step. There is something about the name of Jesus. But what's interesting is right in the name of Jesus is the same concept of pulling things from the spirit into the natural into our world, into our economy. Jesus means Jehovah has become our salvation. The spiritual became physical. And God is superlative. Jesus is superlative. So the greatest possible need is what he became. Not just any need, not healing, not provision. Jesus became the very greatest need that this world needs. Salvation. <laughs> he is amazing. He is amazing. So... We're going to do something. I told my wife what I'd like to end on, and she said, oh, I thought I was ending, and that's what I was going to end on. <laughs> we are going to exercise just a little bit about this verse, this verse. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I feel led to pray for our pastor. We're going to have our pastor come right up here. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Again, it's a relationship. It's not something drummed up. I love you, Jesus. If you'd like to come up and pray, that's great. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Lord, you are so wonderful. I feel your presence right now. I feel your strength. I feel your anointing, Lord. I feel your presence that is here to touch him in the physical. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We declare strength in the name of Jesus. We declare healing in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 
In Jesus' name, we declare it, we proclaim it, we see it, we love you, and we bless your holy, wonderful, matchless name. In Jesus' name, from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, he al kotara bo satara ba ha, la mahasa tara ki a hotara la hotara ba sa. Hallelujah, Hallelujah, in Jesus' name, Amen, Amen, Amen. You're worthy of all the praise. You're worthy of all the honor. And you're worthy of all the glory. Hallelujah. 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 Koyo kotorobo satarabariata da kotarabasa. Lama katarabo satarabariata da la katarabasa. Lama katarabasa. Hallelujah. 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 Glory be to your holy, wonderful, matchless name. I love you, Jesus. <laughs>